Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. I'm excited that you're here. I hope that God moves through this message to reach you so he can move through your life. Be sure to share and subscribe so that we can reach the world with God's word. Enjoy the message. Good morning, church. One second. I'm not going to put you through the pain of listening to me have a cough drop in my mouth the entire time. Good morning, church. Let's start over. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. This is Family Church. My name is Jared. If you are new here, I hope somebody warned you for what's coming. But uh, no, I'm I'm glad you're here. We say it every week that you know you belong. You before you believe. Uh, If you're an atheist, I'm glad you're here. If you're drunk right now, if you're high right now, I'm glad you're here. You're in the right place. There's no other place that you should be other than here in the house this morning. (laughs) Woo! And if you're like me, as we're walking through, if you don't know, we're walking through the book of Jude in a series called Content. This is episode seven, week seven. And... uh, if you're like the rest of us, we are completely going through hell as we're, fi- as we're talking about fighting hell. So I'd love to say I'm sorry for what you're going through, but welcome to Christianity. Nobody said it would be easy. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. That's called the world. Amen. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm having a blast though. Um, you know, it, it, it's a lot of fun just walking through this and taking our time. If you haven't been here before, this is not entertainment. We just slowly grow, go through and grow through the word of God. Uh, I don't mince words because Satan is throwing everything he can at you in the worst way possible. So it is my job to get you to wake up so that you don't end up where you should not be in eternity because God, we are all children of God. I was thinking about that on the way here. Uh, I don't know if it's <clears throat> something that a lot of Christians think is that you know if we're Christians and we're children of God. We all, as weird as this is to grasp, we all descended from Adam and Eve, thus we are all children of God. That is my desire to go after the lost and bring the lost back home because Satan is trying to remove us because he hates us because we are made in his image. He loves to attack God's children. So it's not just those of you that have already accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it's those that are still out in the world that are also the children of God. They are your family, they are your brothers and sisters, and it is our job to try to wake them up to the gospel that saves them from eternal damnation. Welcome to Family Church. As you know, like I said a minute ago, this is, this is week seven of Contend. We're walking through Jude, 25 quick verses. We are doing verses uh, 20 through 21 today. Um, and, and we know from, from what we've learned already that Jude loves to call himself a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. They're both Jesus's brother. They don't throw that out there because they're humble. They don't care about titles. They don't care about positions like we often do. They don't care about flaunting who they know. All they care about is serving their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, and and the, the, the fun thing is they didn't always do that. They grew up in the house with Jesus, having him as their older brother, and they thought when he started saying that he was God and the son of God, that they thought he was out of his mind. And then after he died and was resurrected for our sins, they realized that he was God in the flesh and that he is our Lord and Savior, so they started following him. So it's never too late for you as long as you're on this side of the dirt, This morning, to tag a title to this text, for the note takers, it will be straight from the text. It will be building, praying, waiting. Building, praying, waiting. Two verses, Jude 20 through 21. I say two verses, but I've got like eight scripture references back there, so y'all get ready and buckle up, because we are going through the book. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Ancient of days. We thank you for this ability to come and proclaim your word. We thank you that you saved us, that you reconciled us to yourself in our dirtiest moments when we rejected you. 
We thank you for the unfinished work that you have done in us that we are still being, no, we, that it is finished, but it is unfinished because we are not fully glorified yet. Make no mistake. We thank you for the finished work on the cross. We thank you that you are still pulling us to you, that you are still sanctifying us through that and making us more holy until one day we get to glory with you and see your face and fall down in worship. God, we pray that you send the lost further here, that you expand the stakes of this church, God, not just this building, but us, the body of Christ, the church, because it is not a building. Father, we ask you to do your will, have your way, hijack this service, God. I am your vessel, use me. Holy Spirit, come and fill me. I cannot do this in my weakness. So fill me and fill us with your fire. Fill us with your fire today. Have your way, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So we saw at the beginning of Jude that his original intention was to write this letter to these people, to us, uh, about our common salvation, which is just our current and our future hope in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He wanted to do that, but unfortunately, he saw the false prophets Uh, the false Christians that were eroding the gospel and twisting grace into a license for a licentiousness. We see this so much in churches today where we don't wanna talk about sin and we skirt around sin, so we wanna tell you what feels good, what makes you feel good, so that next week you'll come back and put a couple quarters in the offering plate. Meanwhile, there's people standing on a stage in front of you that are leading you completely straight to hell and you don't even know it. This is the reality. This is the reality. It's not fun to think of, but it is the truth. If it was not the truth, Jesus would have been a liar. You cannot have something false without also having the other side that is true. So Jesus told us, he warned us, there would be false prophets. They come like wolves in sheep's clothing. They come and they stand in front of you. They speak like you. They talk like you. They love on you. They, get, they bring you to dinner. They come to your Thanksgiving. They come to your Christmas. They put on wonderful shows for the holidays. They do all of this lovely, fun stuff in their churches. Meanwhile, they twist the gospel and they bring you further and further further away from it very slowly over time because they're cunning, they're slick, they know how to treat you right, they know how to treat you good, even though they actually just hate you because they're doing everything for their own selfish gain. We're getting heavy. So Jude, he wanted to do this, he wanted to talk to you about the good stuff, but he was disturbed over the state of the church, so thus he said, we need instead to contend for the faith. We need to fight. And I don't know about you, but every week as we've been going through this season, through this series, all we've been doing is fighting, 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 and at this point, thank God for Brandon Lake because we are bringing that hard fought, hallelujah, into this place. So Jude wants us to fight for the faith, the fixed gospel. It does not change. It does not matter if you disagree with what the book says. It is the word of God. Holy, reverent, awesome, unchanging, unfiltered. It is raw. It doesn't matter. You can't rip a page out of it and make it different. It is what it is because he spoke it into existence. You can say it was written by man, but it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, written over 1,500 years from many different offers, all pointing to one person that is Jesus Christ. A numerical and statistical impossibility for all of the cross-references, for everything that could be compiled together. We can take a poll in this room right now and not a single one of us will completely agree on one thing, but somehow, all of these men, living in different time periods, speaking several different languages, all pointed to the same thing. God. God. So my question to you today is, as we see the false prophets, as we see the false Christians, how do we react to it? What do we do in the face of something so blatantly mocking our God, so blatantly mocking his word, twisting it around? Y'all, this is a dialogue. Don't get quiet on me now. This ain't Baptist in here. Some people like to ignore the problem completely. 
and just pretend that it's gonna go away and God will sort it out. He will sort it out, yes, but you cannot ignore it. You cannot ignore it. You can't just turn your back to it. Some say just focus on the fellowship and Jesus will handle the rest. But Jude has shown us that this is naive thinking because people will flock to mockery. That's why you see, and not that every mega church is false, but that's why you see some that are false and people flock to it because it makes them feel good. I am never going to be here to make you feel good. That's Jesus' job. And newsflash, (laughs) if he don't do anything for you in this life, if he doesn't deliver you from whatever it is you're facing, if he doesn't heal your body and you've got that back pain, if you still struggle with addiction and you, mm, and you still struggle with bondage and you still struggle with brokenness and you still struggle with sin and you keep fighting and wondering why nothing is changing, Jesus is simply enough. He doesn't have to do anything. He is enough. You don't need anything other than Jesus. He's already done everything for you. So the greatest thing you need to grasp is that he has already done all that needs to be done for you and the rest, baby, is just the cherry on top. There's the clap. We gotta get the first one out of the way. They will flock to, the, to mockery. They will flock to false thinking. That's why we flock to bars and clubs and, and, and everything else under the, under the sun for entertainment. That's why when Bass Pro opens, there's more people lined up for that than you will ever see lining up for a church service. That's why there's more people going to Morgan Wallen and Zach Brown. I don't even know these people that I shout out their names. That's why all of these concerts that you go to and the Super Bowls, and not that any of that is wrong per se, but we put all of our time and all of our thinking into these things that have no meaning and no merit, and we idolize men and women over the word of God and we wonder why we're struggling with things it's because we have a void inside of us that only Jesus can fill and we keep trying to shovel dirt into it from the world and it does nothing but make the hole bigger evasion is not a tactic for fighting against false prophets so some wanted to ignore it, they, they, they evade it, and others are so afraid of false prophets and false teaching that they will immediately jump and church hop to another church. But Jude shows us that everywhere, every place is in danger because some, some church today that has pure teaching and pure doctrine and the pure word of God is still in danger of being twisted down the line in the next generation. That's why we have to contend for the faith. So evasion is not a tactic and evacuation is not a tactic. Those are not the answers to error. You can't evade it, you can't evacuate it. You have to do something about it. And I know the tendency is to get tired in the third round because we don't have Christianity cardio anymore. So as soon as life gets hard, well, you know what? I've tried that Jesus thing. I give up on it. You know, I'm just gonna go back to doing what I was doing before. Tell me, did that really work out? Because you came out of it to get in here. You came out of it to find Jesus. And then as soon as hell came against you because you weren't going into hell anymore, now all of a sudden you wanna go back to hell thinking hell's got your best interest in line. Hell's gonna look good till it don't. And by then, it's too late. So I pray and I hope that you grasp that, that you grasp the reality of the situation. Y'all, we ain't just raising up saints in this church. We're raising up soldiers for Christ that are gonna stand 10 toes down and stand up for the Lord and contend for the faith. We're praying for holy fire to invade your soul. Because God is not done. The answer to the fight against faith is to fight for faithfulness, not to evade it completely and just hope God sorts it out. Get your face in the book. Get your face in the word of God and stand up for God. You want to be blessed? Stand up for God. You want to prosper? Stand up for God. You want your life to turn around? Stand up for God. And he will stand up for you. So until now, through Jude, all the last six weeks, or six episodes, whatever, of, these, of this series, we have only heard why 
we should contend. We have only heard who we should contend against. We have not yet heard how. So welcome to today. The final, not the final, but finally reaching where we learn how to contend for the faith. And Jude gives us four pieces of wisdom straight in the text. Now, all of these are effective against spiritual darkness and spiritual attacks. And the responsibility for every single one of them is on you. It's on me. But with that, the Holy Spirit, God the Father, and God the Son, Jesus Christ, are all active in every single one of these. You are never alone. But it is your responsibility to do these and to seek these things out. Straight from the text, and I'll give you all four, and then we're going to dive into them. Number one, building. Number two, praying. Number three, keeping. And number four, waiting. Building on the word of God, studying it and applying it, because how are you going to defend something you don't know? We will sit up here and quote the Constitution and defend the Constitution, because don't you dare uh, infringe on my Second Amendment and the right to bear arms, but we don't know a dang thing about the Bible to defend it, except for maybe John 3.16, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and we don't know a single freaking thing about the context of what that was written in. (laughs) Praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping, which is remaining in God's love, and waiting for the return by desiring and anticipating Jesus is Christ, Jesus Christ's return. Are y'all ready? We're gonna have to move. Ephesians 3. Starting in verse 14, but we're just gonna focus on a couple verses, but I'd like to give you a little bit behind for context. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, praying, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through what? The Spirit. Through what? The Spirit. Through what? The Spirit. In your inner being. Notice that the strength doesn't come from you. It doesn't come from you trying to work it out. It doesn't come from you doing anything other than seeking God because it is God's job, the Holy Spirit's job, to provide you with that strength instead of trying to do it yourself. Now, this is to be filled with his life and his energy in every facet and fiber of your being so that it permeates every inch of who you are. This is um, your soul, your motives, your thinking, your feelings, your desires, your purposes, and your motivation, every part of you should be increasingly influenced by him and guided more by him because this allows him to show his strength through you. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Now, rooted, obviously, is an agricultural term for plants, And grounded is an architectural term, structural. So you have plants, uh, agriculture, and you have buildings, grounded, foundation. You have one that is living and one that is building. When you put them together, it is something active. It does not stop. And the reason that we are rooted in his love is because roots have to go deeper and deeper and deeper to find nourishment, to find the thing that sustains the very life force that is within them. To sustain the life, your roots need to stretch deep and deeper and deeper to find that well of living water. And roots do not stop growing until the tree or the plant is dead. There's some trees you can cut 
and the roots will continue to grow and new life can still come forth from that. So if you feel struck down, if you feel persecuted, if you feel abandoned, just remember you are not destroyed. Just let your roots go a little bit deeper. Come on, where y'all at? Wake up this morning. Get down in this word. Get on your face. Seek God. Ask him to plant himself further in your life and be built back up by who he is, by who he is, by who he is and what he has to offer. And y'all, as roots go down, shallow roots don't offer anything of value. We have in our pasture at the house, there's these things that look like trees. They look like trees. They get pretty tall too. And I don't know what they're called, so whatever. The other day, Kelsey asked me to chop them down. Now, me being a man, I decided, well, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna yank it out of the ground. The roots are not deep. So it comes out of the ground very easy. Something that looks deceptively strong doesn't have deep roots and it is easier to topple, it is easier to uproot. So you're wondering why your faith is shaky. It's because your roots ain't going any deep and they're surface level faith and you gotta stop skimming the waters of the well and start diving down. Don't worry about coming back up for breath because he will sustain you the deeper you go. Don't worry about coming back up for breath. Keep going down, keep swimming down. The further down you go, the further Further up, he brings you. He who must decrease, so he will increase. It ain't about you getting more. It's about him giving you more. More of him, not more stuff, not more boats, not more shoes, not more Christmas trees, not more presents under the tree. It's about him giving you more of who he is, about him revealing himself more and more and more to you. So you get more sanctified, more holy, more righteous, and you start doing more good works because faith without works is dead. Y'all ain't ready for this. Show me. Rooted in his love and grounded in his love. This is building on a strong foundation. Building on the solid rock, not the shaky sand that will wash away in every mm, in every storm. The solid rock that is Jesus Christ. The one who built the church on solid rock. And the gates of hell will not come against. And the gates of hell cannot stand against. And nothing, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, baby. Because you are building your life on that solid rock. You are building your life on the Christ who sustained you, who died for you, who rose again so you will meet him in in eternal glory the solid rock Paul is showing us here you know let me finish rooted and grounded in love may have 18 may have strength to comprehend mm, 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 with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ that what surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with what? All the fullness of God. And I ain't got this one on the screen, but let's say it. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask and think and according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Paul is showing you that you need to get a firm grasp on how great God's love is. Because when you do that, you will get a stronger relationship. You will get a deeper relationship with Jesus. You will go further. In Colossians... One, and you, you, me, you, me, you, me, who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. Mm, You were once outside of God's love, not his love. You were once outside of his presence. You were once alienated. You were once separated from the presence of God. You were hostile in mind. You were the son of Satan because you were in the world. But God called you out of it so you are not of the world, but you are in the world. You are not of the world. He called you out of it. You were doing evil deeds. I was doing evil deeds, but God... 
but God. Come on, but God. Doing evil deeds. You were shooting drugs up. You were sleeping with everybody that you could imagine. You were doing everything under the sun that you could to set yourself against the face of God. And he still came down in his righteousness, knowing everything that you would do and came after you. And he said, this one is mine. And now is the time. And the sheep know his voice. And he pulled you out of the darkness. And he wrangled you back from the arms of Satan. And he pulled you up out of the darkness and shined his light inside of you. Oh. Oh, I'm preaching better than y'all are shouting. I'll have a Holy Ghost meltdown inside of myself. But God, he has now reconciled. Thank you, Jesus. In his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above Reproach. He saved you to present you to himself holy and blameless. Amen. Quit holding your own past against you when God already wiped the slate clean and made you as white as snow. He took that nasty garment off of you and clothed you in glorious rags and clothed you in glorious wonder and he took it all away. And the only person holding the past against you is you and Satan. And once you accept the past and pull it out of his hands, you take the weapon away from him and you give it to God and it's no longer a weapon against against you. It is a weapon for the kingdom of the almighty Christ. And you can use it against the hell. You can use it against the darkness. And you can use it mm, to go forth and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we like to do this and hide it because it it looks nasty. And man, what what would my friends think if, if they knew that I struggle with this. What would my job think? I hope they don't do a background check. What would my family think if they knew I struggled with this? And you don't realize that's the devil sinking his claws into your head. And all you've got to do is pray that Jesus Oh, releases you. You can free yourself from that spirit by calling on the name of Jesus and praying the name of Jesus over you and releasing that demon from you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. I mean, come on, y'all. You've got the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and you want to sit here living under the sons of Satan? No, we're living under the son of God. We're worshiping the son of God who set us free from all that crap. And above reproach. See, this is when someone accuses you of something and slanders your name and brings a charge against you. But it's false because you are living a holy life now. And it might have been something you struggled with back then, but you ain't stepping in that anymore. And this doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with sin, and it doesn't mean you're not going to struggle with temptation, but it means when they bring something against you, and this, and they say such and such person is doing this, and they believe this, and they say this, and they live like this, it's false. And you don't have to go through any of that, because vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and he has your back. He will fight your battles. All you got to do is focus on him. They can talk all the smack they want about you. And blessed are you for being persecuted for his name, for his sake. So keep standing up for God. Keep righteously standing up for God. Keep digging your face in that book and you will see him lift you up in due time. Oh, fire. I knew I should have wore this hoodie today. Verse 23. All of that's good, but if... If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. We don't like that if. All that's good. He's reconciled you and he will present you holy and blameless and above reproach. 
if you continue in the faith, if you continue in the faith, if you continue to pray, if you continue to study the word of God, if you continue to present him to the world, if you continue to submit yourself to him, if you continue to obey him, if you continue to surrender to him and his will, not trying to get him to bow down to your will. You to throwing your expectations and your dreams and your hopes out the window and saying, God, what do you have in store for me? What did you make me for? Because if I was chasing my dreams, I wouldn't be up here and shouting in front of y'all. I'd probably be fried down on a power line somewhere, but hey, I'd have a bigger bank account, right? Because that's what matters to us, right? Good. And see, we hear that, and we hear the pastor come up here and shout about reading our Bible and doing this and being obedient and doing all of that stuff, and we think it's all about just those works and doing this and doing that, and it's not the routine that makes you righteous, okay? But the problem is, it's easier to fall away when you fall off. See, it's easier to fall away when you fall off. Can you put the Second Timothy verse up there? All scripture is breathed out by God. And what? That was so weak. Profitable, I'll do it. Profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction. We hate that one. And for training in righteousness. All scripture was breathed out so you could be built up. Oh, y'all slow this morning. See, it ain't about just doing this church thing because this ain't what it's about. This is not Christianity. You and your relationship with Jesus is what Christianity is. Not coming in here and sitting and listening to me. Not even reading this book. Not being able to quote this book. You having a relationship with your Lord and Savior. And he breathed out this book so that you could be built up by this book. So you could get a grasp of who he is and quit worrying about the world, quit having anxiety about the world, quit worrying about what you're gonna do tomorrow, quit worrying about what you're gonna eat after church, quit worrying about how you're gonna pay your bills, quit worrying about who's gonna bring what on Thanksgiving, quit worrying about who's gonna bring what on Christmas, quit worrying about who's gonna be able to afford the Christmas gifts. All that stuff that we put before God and we don't cast our anxieties at his feet, we hold on to them and sink to the bottom of the ocean of despair. Trained, y'all, trained. You are supposed to be getting trained. Yes. Trained, built up. It's breathed out so you could be built up. That's why Jude literally said in the verse, build yourselves up. Verse 20, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. That's plural, because it ain't a solo event. It's a spiritual quest of community. Welcome to family church. It's more than just a name. See, the first sign that a Christian is in danger of falling away is when they start isolating themselves and they start removing themselves from the body. But we don't really like isolation, isolation all that much. So as soon as we remove ourselves from the body, uh-oh, here we go. We start asking other people to come join us. Because if I'm falling away, I want you to fall away with me. Because misery loves company. I'm miserable. I don't want to press into God. I don't want to truly believe this book. I just want to sound like I believe this book. So as I step away from the church, I want you to step away from the church with me. Those are the people you need to cut off to strike them down and rip them out of your life. Remove yourself from them. Remove their influence from them and focus on God. Quit focusing on the ones that left and focus on God. We don't worry about what's behind us. We worry about what's before us. And God is behind us and he is before us and he's all around us he goes before you to prepare that way for you he's already got your future planned out your purpose planned out and all you've got to do is this and walk forward it don't matter if you've got to crawl or drag yourself across the carpet keep moving forward 
And Jude saw this problem. He saw Christians drifting from fellowship and falling into the arms of heretics. So he said, build yourselves up. Get in the word of God. Remember what we told you. Remember what the apostles told you. Remember what happened to the people in the Old Testament. Remember the false prophets. Remember those who came before us and learn by their example. Because when you learn by their example and, excuse me, and you see what they did, you know what to look for so they can't do it to you. But they can do it to you when you don't know how they do it. Hence why I shout at you all the time to bring your Bible, to bring a notepad and get in the word of God. If you're tired of hearing it, speak to God. No, y'all don't realize he gives me this to bring to you. So the reason why it keeps hashing around on repeat is because clearly it's not getting done. Oops. Gonna be three people in here next week. And we gonna have revival. (laughs) Oh, Lord. (laughs) Build yourself up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. This is the second time that the Holy Spirit was mentioned in this entire letter, the second time. You know what the first time was? Anybody here last week? Verse 19, the false prophets, the false Christians that were devoid of the Spirit. That was the first time by pointing out those who didn't have him, not it, him. He is a person in the Trinity, in the Godhead. He has feelings and thoughts and emotions. He can be grieved. And he's not just a spirit, it is definitive. The Holy Spirit. Put some respect on the name. (laughs) See, he showed us, Jude showed us in 19, these people were devoid of the Spirit. But you, but us, the Christians, we are devoted We're not devoid, we're devoted to God, to his spirit, and we will pray. See, the Holy Spirit is God's gift at Pentecost that he poured out with tongues of fire, with gifts, with anointing to bring boldness. Y'all wonder why Elijah had the boldness and the courage that he had, why John the Baptist had the courage and the boldness he had. He had the Holy Spirit in him. That's why when he was still in the womb, it made the baby jump. It made John the Baptist jump because he knew the other one in that womb was Jesus. That was the Messiah. That's who they were waiting on. The Holy Spirit was in John before he was even born. And he is in you the minute that you convert to Christianity and you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are saved, you are sanctified, and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. That means there is no such thing as a Christian that does not have the Spirit. That's why I said last week, you can have all the hallmarks of Christianity and none of the holiness. Y'all, we act like the only people that can act are those that are in movies and television. Where's the lie? So then there's the false message that spread back then and still spreads today that there's separate classes of Christians and Christianity. So they created, because we like hierarchy, we like status, we like to be able to be pompous and self-righteous and look down our nose at somebody else, no matter what it is. My shoes are more clean than your shoes. I didn't buy mine at Marshall's, mine is authentic. I used to drive a Harley, so I'm gonna pick on the Harley guys. If you don't drive a Harley, we hate every other motorcycle. That's what we do. So they came up with the idea that there was a lower class of Christian that was saved but did not have the Holy Spirit. And then they went all the way to the other extreme that there was the upper class of Christians that they had the Holy Spirit, which meant that they also had higher spiritual awareness. Now, the Holy Spirit does several things. I'm not gonna list all of them. We don't have time. 
We don't, because I got a lot more to cover. <laughs> he does several things, the least of which is bringing awareness of the way things are and the way things should be. On a personal level, in your own life, this is called conviction. That's why, (laughs) y'all, we got kids' church, so if your kids are in here and you don't like the way I talk, that's tough luck, you should have put them in there. That's why before you were a Christian, you didn't mind shacking up with your girlfriend or your boyfriend, and then when you got saved and you did it, you realized, this feels wrong now. That's called conviction. That's why when you had all the needles in your arms and you were waking up hungover as heck and you started realizing, this ain't right. That's called conviction. That's why when you come here and you struggle with sin, that's conviction. If you're not struggling with sin, you're not being convicted of sin, and that means you are strongly in danger. I've said it before. The worst thing you can do is sin and sleep. When it no longer bothers you, you are in a very, very bad place. And that is when Satan will isolate you and tempt you to continue to remove yourself and continue to try to get you to, hey, don't tell them what you're dealing with because then they're gonna think less of you. The Bible says confess your sins to one another. That's so we can encourage one another. But the way that Satan gets us to struggle with sin is by telling you you're the only one dealing with this. Everything you deal with. You're the only one that struggles with eating the entire tub of ice cream when you open it. (laughs) You're the only one that struggles with eating the entire sleeve, here it is, of family size Oreo. Yeah, y'all know I'm bringing it up. (laughs) You do not eat one or two, baby. You eat the whole sleeve. And the only reason you stop is probably come from conviction. (laughs) Tell me, when that hot sun is on Krispy Kreme... Come on, you can eat a whole dozen. I will, I will take diabetes in Jesus' name for the hot sign. Hey, hey, I ain't perfect. Uh, sanctification is a lifelong process. Y'all, if they put a Krispy Kreme in town and you see me gaining weight, somebody strike me down and tell me that I am living wrong. Point out the gluttony. That's why they're here. God's like, nah, nope. <laughs> I love Dunkin's got good coffee, but not donuts. Okay, America ain't run. It, the reason it runs on Dunkin' is because you're only getting the coffee there. <laughs> Where are we at? Oh, <laughs> conviction <laughs> on a personal level. It's conviction when you see it and you're aware of it in others. That's called love. That's why. We are called and supposed to point out sin in others, not to bash it over their head and tell them and judge them and condemn them. You are not ju- you, you, mm, you're supposed to righteously judge others, not condemn them. But see, the world loves to throw it in your face and tell you, oh, you know, only God can judge me. Yes, sir, he can. And guess what? He will. Perfectly. No bias. No bribes. And it's coming. For me and for you. That ain't something to be scared of when you're living righteously. It ain't something to be afraid of when you are genuinely seeking his face. Now listen, God is not afraid of your doubts. Oh, we don't like that. God is not afraid of your curiosity. Ask questions. You don't understand something, seek it out and ask questions. He's not afraid of it. All of the prophets dealt with moments where they wondered, where are you? John the Baptist, the one chosen to prepare the way for the Lord when he was in prison and Jesus is out performing all these miracles for people and he sends his disciples to ask, are you him or are you not? And Jesus didn't shame him for doubting. He said, go and tell him. The work of the kingdom is being done. And then when they left, he praised John's character to those still in the crowd. 
God is not afraid of your questions. Now, this praying in the Holy Spirit at surface level, if you read it wrongly, you're going to think it means in tongues. And if you can't pray in tongues, and I can't even pray in tongues, I'll just be transparent. Don't feel ashamed because you can't. That's reading it wrongly. This has nothing to do with tongues. Now, that's not saying you can't pray in tongues. And while we're here, I know there's been some incidents recently with someone that has been in the building praying in tongues. Listen, there's tongues from the Holy Spirit in the right moment, and there's tongues from evil spirits that are working against us. No coincidence that I prayed against witchcraft out of nowhere. In a corporate setting, if someone starts yelling out in tongues, it is supposed to be followed by interpretation. You can pray on your own time, in your own space, in tongues. But if you are going to interrupt the move of God, it better be from God, and it better be interpreted. And if it's not, I will call you out. There is no place for demonic in here. There is no place for witchcraft in here. You can come and you can hear about Jesus and you can seek repentance, but if you're going to be praying from hell against us, I will throw you out personally. You are not welcome here. This is a move of God. We stand ten toes down for God. And I will spiritually smack you upside the head until you find Jesus. And if not, you can find the front door. So this is not tongues. He's talking about praying in the Holy Spirit. Romans 8. Oh, we got rush. You're fine. Don't say that. I, mm. <laughs> they can leave and hold a finger up. <laughs> yeah, if you got to leave, hold your finger up. <clears throat> Get that old. If you know, you know. All right, Romans 8. Y'all, you can't make my ADD do that. I got to stick to what we're doing. <clears throat> Likewise, the Spirit, look, they were ready. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. See, you're getting in your prayer closet and you're wondering what to pray and you're like, man, I don't know the words to say. That's why he is there. When you don't know what else to pray, that's why he is there. When you don't know what to pray about, when you start sitting in silence, that's why he is there. <clears throat> but we too often get in our prayer time and we focus about ourselves. Like James and John, wanting to sit at the right hand of Jesus. But then in 1 John 5, 14, John finally turned around after he got corrected. And he said to focus on God's will first. But Paul in Romans is showing us that in our weakness, when we don't know what to do, God is there. The Holy Spirit is there. He is praying through you and for you. He is lifting you up and he intercedes with groans. He knows God's will and he intercedes for groans through groans and he searches hearts, knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Mm, and y'all know 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Now, if y'all remember in Jude at verse 16, he talked about grumblers. That's what the ones who are devoid of the Spirit do. But you've got the Holy Spirit in you. So while they're grumbling, you're groaning. While they're grumbling, you're groaning. While they're complaining, you're interceding. While, you're complain while they're complaining, you're interceding. They're, inter they're irritated, but you're interceding through the Spirit. You don't need to have the words to say. You don't need to have a 45-minute prayer time. It ain't amount about the amount of words. It's about the heart. It's about the heart. That's why those who are devoid of the Spirit grumble pathetically. And you groan prayerfully 
for holiness, for righteousness, for the cutting out of sin, for the refining fire, for the lost, for God's will when you don't even know his will, but he knows it and he will speak it through you. He tells you to go talk to somebody and you're like, I don't know the words. Go up and take the step, baby, and he will meet you there and he will give you the words. Now, I know for a lot of people, and I'm just going to touch on this quick, we wonder how to pray. Jesus told you in Matthew 6. Uh, Let's start in seven. This isn't on the screen until we get to nine. But he said, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. It don't matter how long you pray, as long as it is genuine. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now pay attention to the words. Verse nine, pray then Like this. Like this. Not pray this exactly. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying this and quoting this. But at some point, you've got to grow up and move past it. That's like you being a 45-year-old adult and still praying, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. You've got to grow up. It's not a script. It's a blueprint. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is mm, in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Not my bread for the next 12 years. Not my bread for the next 12 months. Not my bread for the four years that we were living in hell under the wrong regime in America. Give me my daily bread. And forgive us of our debts, our sins, as we have also forgiven our debtors, those who sinned against you. That's the hard one. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It is not a script. It is a blueprint. There's two ways to look at this. Four things. Reverence. Hallowed be your name. Priorities. God's will first. Number three, repentance. And number four, Protection. Another way to look at it is ACTS, an acronym. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication for yourselves and others. Notice what you need and want is always at the end. Now, I'm guilty of this myself as well. When we run to God in a moment and we're like, I need X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. Give me this, give me that, give me this. See you next week. And you're wondering why. Well, God doesn't answer my prayers. That's how we do it to him. But when people do it to us, (laughs) yeah, when somebody says, hey, and you're like, nah. If you text me just, hey, you, (laughs) you put all you want, all you need in that first text. And then I will decide if I want to answer you. When you just send, hey, or yo, or are you there? No, I'm not there until you text me what else you want. Why? Because I'm not getting roped into a conversation. (laughs) God's working on me. I'm just being real with y'all. And don't act like you don't. Tell me all of it. Give me all the details. Not, hey, hey, what's up? Hey, I need you to come do all of this stuff and let me use your truck and all of this. Oh, I, no, I'm busy right now. But we do it to God. God, I'm busy right now. I need you to do this and this and this. I really need my bills paid. I need this. I need that. I would love that new sweater for Christmas. Can you do something here? Goodbye. Amen. Uh, you know, hallelujah, blah, 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 blah. And we wonder, why is he not answering? Because you aren't praying. You're giving God your grocery list. 
and saying, give me everything and I give you nothing. That's why you need to grasp and grip that all you need is Jesus. That's why the first step is reverence. Know who you're talking to. And then pray for his will, for the lost to come home, for the church to grow, not the building, for the church, the body of Christ. Praying for repentance, cut out my sins, the known ones and the unknown ones. Why? Because I need it. I need to be more holy. I need to be more righteous. I need to quit being jealous. I need to quit being bitter. I need to quit being angry. I need to quit being bound by things that you have already released me from. And when do we do this? I got so many things. Ephesians, again. Six. Where did I just go? That's right. How'd you know? Oh, you looked at it on Planning Center. Praying at all times. Oh, look, there it is again. In the spirit. With all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all saints. This is in the section of the armor of God. Why? Because we are at war. You are at war. You don't get to sit on the sidelines in war. Now, some of you maybe not be directly on the front lines, but you're still in war. In the military, they still needed janitors. They still needed cooks to go and help at war. You still have a job to do. No part of Christianity says to sit on your butt and do nothing. You were directly told by your master, by your Lord and Savior, Matthew 28, 19, Luke, at the end of Luke, and in uh, Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, all creation, and make disciples. I don't know why we think that we deserve to be woken up, but everybody else needs to stay asleep. There's people dying every second, every minute of every single day. Where is the urgency in the church to reach them? Where is it? I shouldn't be the only one looking like this. And you don't have to have the same passion, but where is your desire to reach people? Where is your passion and urgency and energy to reach people? This should be the norm, but it's not because we're comfortable and we worry about reputation and the life that we've built, the life that we have built, not the life that Jesus has intended for us. I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to lose my family. Well, guess what? All of those things you're going to lose anyways. Earth will pass away and heaven will pass away. All of this gets burnt up. So why are you holding on to it like you're going to take it with you? Praying at all times for not just ourselves, for each other. Listen, prayer is not just another spiritual weapon. It is the very act of of war itself. It is the battle itself. It is when we work together with God to gain victory for yourself and for others. That is why prayerlessness in a church is dangerous. Because when we are not praying diligently, we are surrendering to the enemy. And we are saying, you win. Newsflash, this building is open every Saturday at 5 to 6 p.m. for corporate prayer. There is not enough of you showing up to pray. I know we love our weekends, and it's already so much to come to church on a Sunday. I got to keep some people in here for next week. If hell was directly coming against your family and it had your child, it had your wife, it had your family member directly in its grips. If someone broke into your house and was holding a gun to your family's head 
And they said, I will leave if you just say Jesus. Would you do it then? Of course you would. So why aren't we doing it now? Because that is literally what is going on. Hell hates you. It hates your family. It wants every single one of you to die. That's why there's generational curses. That's why you're struggling with what your daddy struggled with. And he struggled with what his daddy struggled with. And you're wondering, how am I going to break this? By getting on your face and praying to God and seeking God and asking Jesus to help you with it. And then you break the curse and hell can't hold it against you. And it won't hold it against your family any longer. Do you want to break it or do you want to bow down to it? Thank you. Verse 21. Y'all ready to go home? Well, it ain't given that. It's given, get done. It's given, shut up. It's given, I don't like this. It's given, I ain't coming back next week. It's given, this is too tough. Ah, I'm so, mm. God, the state of the church is pathetic, and I'm sick of it. It's like spiritual sissies. I'm not saying y'all are sissies. So before I know like my stuff gets so twisted and offended, I mean, if the shoe fits, put it on the foot. Lace it up and start walking. And I, none of this is condescending. I hope you grasp that. This, uh, y'all, when, I, when, when God gives me the message and the word, it has to work through me first before I can bring it to you. It's tough. It's tough to bring you this. It's tough to put your entire family on display. It's tough to leave everything behind and trust everything to God. It's tough to do that. It's tough to give up your dreams. It's tough to say, God, crush me and rip my sin out. But I'm not settling for the bottom of the barrel anymore. I'm settling for Jesus. I'm going to stand up for Jesus. So whether there's five people in here or 50,000 in here next week, I'm going to keep preaching this word. I'm going to keep preparing the way for God because time is running out and it's time to do something about it. It's time to wake up. It's time to realize God is coming and we have to be ready. So get ready. Stop trying to do everything on your own. Amen. 21, let's go. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Amen. This is obviously not suggesting that your salvation is reliant on your efforts. God told us that he does not desire that any should perish. And in his perfect love, in his patience, he is passionate to save everyone, all of his children, from our own disobedience. And that's why I get so frustrated Because the promise of salvation, the very act of salvation should be driving you to echo his love with your obedience. Right. That's right. That's right. But we don't do it. And then I get to stand up here and yell at everybody and say, wake up. God is doing something. Yeah. And endure all the, oh, he's mean. He's angry. Why does he sound? No, I'm not angry. It's righteous indignation. It's passion. You don't recognize it because he ain't got any. You're worried about the wrong stuff, man. God don't care about the eagles. God don't care about Grateful Dead. He don't care about baseball. He don't care about football. He cares about your soul. And so does Satan. But we're too busy handing it to Satan on a silver platter. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm overseeing the state of the church just struggle and fall into moral decline. Where are the saints? Where are the righteous? Where are the people standing up? Where are the ones that say, what do you need done? What do you need cleaned? What do you need to purchase the 
land? What do you need to reach people? Where are the comments to push the algorithm on YouTube and on Facebook and on TikTok so the lost can be reached? Where are the saints? Oh, we sit in here and we do nothing except clap as if God desires just your hand service. Ain't nobody coming back now. We will build on the ashes of what was burned off. So if you don't want to return and you don't like where this is headed, I love you. I pray for you. You don't have to like it, but this is where we're going. We're tired of settling for second best. We're tired of settling for Christianity that is dying, that looks good because it's wrapped up on a silver tray with funny little knickknacks and flowers and candies. We're tired of it. It makes us sick. We're pushing through traditions. We're leaving the past behind. We're standing up for God. We're standing up for his righteousness. We're going to stand up. We're going to prepare the way. And if it clears the building, it clears the building. I will preach to three people or 300,000. I will stand up for God. And if you want to come with me, then come with me. But we are leaving the American church behind and we are pushing forward. We're tired of what it has been. We're tired of it. And we're going into the wilderness to prepare the way for the Lord. And if you don't want to, we love you and we pray for you. Throughout the gospel, we are reminded that if we love God, we keep his commandments. And the very last one is to go and make disciples. And Jesus says, if we abide in his love, we will, if we obey, we abide in his love. The greatest expression of obedience is love. And we have none of it anymore. Love leads to chasing the lost including the ones who were in the church and left, including the ones who stumbled, including the ones who slandered you, including the ones who hurt your feelings. But churches are not contending anymore. They're too busy full of contention and fighting each other. We fight over the dumbest, the stupidest things. That's why there's 57,000 denominations and nobody can decide on which one is best. None of them are best. Jesus Christ is best. It's Christianity. It is in the Bible. The word Christianity is in the Bible. That's what they started being called in the Bible. It wasn't Baptist. It wasn't Methodist. It wasn't Lutheran. It wasn't Mormon. That's a lie. It wasn't any of that stuff. It was just following Jesus. But we had to make traditions. We had to be like the Pharisees that we spoke against and make new rules and make new platforms and make new positions. We don't want platforms. We want presence. We don't want performance. We want presence. He said, my house will be a house of prayer. So y'all, 5 p.m. on Saturdays, get your butt in here and intercede for your family. Intercede for your friends. Intercede for your job. Intercede for the lost. Intercede for the gospel to continue to grow forth. Intercede for the kingdom. Intercede for your family. So we see keep yourselves in the love of God. I'm wrapping up. This does not mean you can remove yourself from, love, from God's love. Nothing can separate you from God's love. But there is a way to position yourself outside of it to where you only face his anger, his wrath. That's what hell is going to be. Out of his love, separated from his presence. This is the same thing as you loving your kids and when they make you mad and do something disobedient, you're angry at them. You still love them, hopefully, but you're mad at them. That's how important obedience is. First, and waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. If you've been paying attention, both of these verses gave you the Trinity. Verse 
You were praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, and waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is the Trinity on full display. Deny it if you want. It is real. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense because we're human. But we see with waiting, the entire Old Testament, everybody was waiting. And Micah, in the last book of the Old Testament, it closed with waiting. And then the New Testament opens with Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, continuing in that hope, keeping that hope alive, and continuing waiting. Because they had the faith to believe in promises that don't make sense unless they're kept. But just because they didn't see it in their lifetime didn't mean that they stopped pursuing Just because you don't see it in your lifetime doesn't mean you stop pursuing. And once Jesus left this earth, that is when we began waiting. We're still in the period of waiting. Y'all can come on. I didn't know this was gonna be this heavy. Oh, one day the promise that he returns will come. It will come. And I pray that you meet us in the clouds. I'm not getting left behind. You're not getting left behind. You're not getting left behind. <laughs> Some will. Some will. Some in this room will. And I hate that. Y'all, I know I'm not for everybody. And I know I'm abrasive. I know I'm brutal and blunt. (sighs) It's a little much. (laughs) I'm not. I am unashamedly this way. I am unafraid. I am unchanging. I am who I am because he made me who I am. And I understand I'm not for everybody. I'm for everybody. And I get it. I get it. It's loud. It's rough. When John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, he didn't come looking like what people expected. He came in camel's hair. From a line of priests, he should have been in the city in robes. And instead, he was in the wilderness. And all these people left just to go see him. And I'm not saying you were not doing a good job, so do not take this the wrong way. It has nothing to do with him before anyone wants to twist it. But the problem with so many in the church is that we were so used to hearing preaching one way that when someone comes and just stands on the truth and just walks through the truth and is passionate for the truth, we reject it because we don't like how it sounds, because it steps on our toes, because it's loud, because it's abrasive. Jesus was the same way. And y'all, oh, he didn't raise his voice. He rebuked his disciples. He made a whip. Do you know how much time it would take to make a whip and beat people out that were abusing his temple? So God has been tired of the state of the church and he's raising people up that look different, that are standing on the word of God, that are not afraid of the word of God. So hate me if you will, but I love the Lord and I hope to lead you to the Lord. If it's all I can do, I hope you pick up on my passion, on my love, on my quest for truth. We're tired of the lies. We're tired of traditions. We just want the truth. 
and we're over not getting it. We have the present possession of eternal life already, but we do not experience it yet until we are glorified. But we're not called to sit here. The eager anticipation for that should be like a fire. You can turn the lights down. Like a fire in your bones. It should be unquenchable, unshakable, undeniable. It should burn and bubble within you to where every part of you is on fire for God and speaking about God and living for God and chasing God and chasing the lost, pursuing him, proclaiming him, and preparing people for him. We have to stay working while we are waiting. We have to stay working. Y'all give me two minutes. In Luke 12, if you have the ESV, it says you must be ready. In Luke 12, 35 through 40, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning and be like men who are (sighs) waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline a table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake. Blessed are those servants. But know this. That if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the son of man is coming at an hour you do not expect we have spent our entire lives every single person in this room thinking that we have more time acting like we have more time and we don't we are already living on borrowed time we love to sing live like you were dying from what's his face Tim McGraw when we literally are dying nobody myself included if God said it was my time and I walked out of this door and was shot in the face or got in a wreck on the way home if it's my time it's my time I'll see you when you get there. But we are not guaranteed the next moment. The trumpet could sound right now. Right now. But we don't anticipate it. We don't look for it. We don't listen for it. Because we think, well, it hasn't happened yet. Is it even going to really happen? And we spend all of our time doing everything else under the sun other than preparing. He saved you. He saved me. He saved my wife. I don't know what you've been through, but I know the hell that I've walked through. 
and still walk through. And he brought me out of it. And he still brings me through it. I'll be the first to admit, and my wife can agree, if I don't have Jesus, I'm a piece of actual crap. We all are. But don't nobody like to admit it and hear it. We were all alienated. We were all going our own way and we thought it good and then God came in and wrecked all of our plans. And in the moment we wondered why. Why us? Why now? Why me? Why doesn't it happen to anyone else? Because we love to feel alone in our darkest moments. And only when we get through those moments and get past all of the pain do we see the purpose. Do we see the glory? You've got to get through the grief to get to and see the glory. Whatever you're facing today, tomorrow, in 10 years, something becomes of it. brought me here to fight for the faith to fight against bad doctrine against bad behavior bad beliefs against stagnation against sleepy Christians against apathy against division everything that is against God. I have been put here for the purpose of cleaning it up and preparing the way for the Lord. It's tough, y'all. It's tough to stand before you and pour it all out and be misjudged, to be misunderstood. To be mistreated, misspoken, to be twisted and to be mocked, to be lied about and shamed and have rumors. To watch the attendance go up and down like a roller coaster and wonder, God, what are you doing? To watch the refining fire and it's easy for the enemy to get into your head and tell you it's all your fault. You're not doing a good job. You're not doing it right. Are you sure this is what you're supposed to do? The devil is a liar. But I stand before you today. And whether you misjudge my heart and misunderstand my heart, that's not up to me. God made it tough. But he made my forehead like flint. And as stubborn as you are to reject it, I'm more stubborn to smack you in the face with it. And I will keep screaming at you to wake up and do something because your blood will never be on my hands. I will keep chasing the lost. I will keep searching for the lost because he found me. I didn't find him. I wasn't the one that was there. He was. And he found me. I grew up in this. And it meant nothing. 
until it did. And for many of you, this means nothing. And you think it does, but it doesn't. And I say that not to judge you. I'm not trying to judge you. I'm not trying to shame you or be mean to you. I'm never yelling at you out of anger. It's urgency. I'm tired of it. I'm not supposed to talk about this stuff, but I'm tired of it. I'm honestly, I'm tired of being misjudged. I want you to understand my heart. Because I'm thick, I'm thick-skinned, and I don't care, but eventually it does get exhausting. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. But God, yeah. and the only reason I can do this is because I get on my face, yeah, that's right. and I plead to Jesus, and I beg to God, decrease me and increase you. That's all I'm here to do is to prepare the way for the Lord. I don't even know if this message made sense today, especially not the end. I'm just trying to wake people up. stand y'all if you need prayer and you do (laughs) we all do there ain't no if you need prayer come to the altar Don't, don't wait don't hold back I don't have, I'm never polished. I don't care about polished. God is moving. God is moving and he wants you here with the movement. So whatever you're facing, whatever you're fighting, come forward, come get prayer. We will pray for you. They will worship and I have one more thing that I want to pray, but now is not the moment. As they worship Set your sights on God, on heaven, and realize you, you, need to, you need to sing. I don't care how bad your voice is. God doesn't care how bad your voice is. He deserves your worship. And the song today is the song that is sung around his throne 24-7 for all of eternity. And you need to know heaven heaven comes down I worship I worship I know we're running long but I can share one more thing with you If you have to go, you're dismissed. If you're hungry, hold on. The book of Acts. Chapter one, verse four, and while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And they waited.
waited. And they waited. And they waited. They spent days and days praying. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This was the promise of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said he would send them and it would charge them to take the gospel from where they were to all the ends of the earth. And until we got to that point in history, only a select few had experienced the Holy Spirit, but he is available to each and every single one of us. And yes, we are sealed by his spirit as we convert to Christianity. But I have felt led today to pray for the fire, for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that you be set apart, that you be renewed, that you be emblazed and emboldened for the work, for the purpose that Christ has set you for. Now, I'm not one for tradition. But if we can all stretch our hands to heaven as a sign of surrender, as a sign of longing, Father, Almighty God, Adonai, Elohim, Yahweh, Ancient of Days, Jehovah, Rapha, Nisi, God, you are ever wise and ever glorious. You alone hold all the power all the authority. Come. Help me, God. Help me, King Lawrence. Help me, God. Fathers, we stand here in submittance and surrender to you today. We ask, we beg, we seek, we ask, and we knock for the Holy Spirit. God, we ask you, I ask you, I beg you, pour your spirit out, not like another Pentecost, like a stronger Pentecost, like never before has the world seen. We ask you, pour your fire down into your saints. Fill them with your fire. Fill them with your spirit. Charge us for the work that you have equipped us for. God, we ask you, push us forth. Build us, grow us, crush us, refine us. God, strengthen us and change us, God. Equip us, God. Strengthen us in your glory, God. Tear down the strongholds over people's lives right now, God. Tear down the demonic. Tear down the witchcraft. Tear down everything, every evil spirit that comes against this house and everybody that listens, every saint, every sanctified person, God, we ask you, Father, begin the revival. Begin the harvest. Let it start today. Send your saints. Send your lost. God, fill us with your fire. Fill us afresh. Come in like a mighty rushing wind, like a flood, and fill us like never before. Equip us, God. Equip your saints. Charge us like we have never been charged before. Come on. 
God, we have a job to do, and the only way we can do it is through your Spirit and by your Spirit. So, Father, we ask you, where two or three are gathered in your name, and we are all here seeking you, whether on our face physically or spiritually, we are surrendered to your will, and it is your will that all your saints be filled with the holy fire of the Holy Spirit. So, God, I ask you, forgive us, search our hearts, forgive us of our sins, equip us, God, Wipe away whatever is there holding us back. Any demonic entity or spirit I cast down in Jesus' name. And I ask, Lord, in Jesus' name that you command them to be released. Release your saints from the grips of hell, from the grips of the enemy, and fill us with your fire, with your spirit, so that they cannot return, so that they cannot return, so that your word will go forth and will not be void. God, equip us, stir us up. Up. Let this place be unmovable. Let this place be unshakable. Let this place be passionate. Let this place be prayerful. Let this place be heavenly, kingdomly minded. Pour your spirit out, God. Wreck us. Decrease us and increase yourself. Pour your spirit into us so that he points back to you. Remove the agendas. Remove the programs. Remove the platforms. Remove the need for selfish gain, selfish desires, for pride, for lust, for bitterness, for division. All of that crap, God, get it out of the building and clean it out. Clean the house and burn holy fire and sanctify your saints. Refine your saints, God. Let today be the hallmark. Let today be the stamp of approval. Let today begin the hallmark. Harvest. Let today begin the harvest. The lost will come home. This church will go forth. This church will make disciples. We will take back. We will dominate St. Augustine. We will dominate this county, this nation. We will go forth to every nation in the world and proclaim your truth. And hell will come against us. But you will never be defeated. Come, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come. Pour your spirit out, God. Put fire in them, Lord. 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 Cast out the spirit of fear. Cast out the sickness. Cast out the shame. Cast out the need for man's opinionated approval. And know that we are already anointed and sanctified and accepted and affirmed by you, God. Holy Spirit, breathe again like a mighty rushing wind. Knock us down and build us back up. And let us proclaim and prepare the way for the Lord in your mighty and matchless and holy and unshaken in the name above all names the name that casts everything down the name that brings healing the name that brings sanctified believers together the name that has brought salvation the name above all names the name that no weapon formed against will prosper in the mighty and in the majestic and in the matchless unmet name of Jesus Christ amen amen
Hey, I hope that message spoke to you today. I want to say thank you to everybody who is involved at Family Church and those who help support this ministry. If you would like to get more involved, you can click the link in the description or head to our website, familychurch.social. We would love to connect with you, and you can find all of our social media platforms on our website. Also, if this message spoke to you in any way today and you liked it, consider sharing it on your social media in any way that you would like so that we can help reach those far from God and return them to the arms of the Father. We want to see God work through you. We love you. Thanks again for listening. God bless you.